I appreciate so much this opportunity to be with you brethren here in the study at Columbia. I've uh, said before I want to encourage you brethren in this study and uh, I resolve to put as much time into being here as I possibly can. Really appreciate the topic selection and appreciate the assignment that was made to myself, which you can see on this slide. I was asked to briefly explain manuscript differences that affect formal equivalency translations. And anybody who knows me knows that I've never briefly explained anything in my life. <laughs> if you ask me what time it is, I'll probably tell you how to build a clock. So, having said that, I plunge into my task. What we're going to do is uh, take a look at these three passages of Scripture, as time permits, and the questions that were given to me. The first one is a textual issue, and in some of the modern eclectic texts, and this is reflected in some of the modern translations, a phrase that we're used to seeing in the King James Version is not included, that phrase you see there. In Romans 12 and verse 1, we'll find a, a difference in translation, rather I would say probably a difference in interpretation in the way that different translations render a somewhat uh, perplexing, difficult, a, um, a, a term that has proved to be very difficult for many. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, the question is our obedience uh, or is Christ's obedience in view in this passage. Maybe you've read these passages ahead of time and you know where uh, we're going to be looking tonight. Well these are the passages from the New King James Version. This is rather Romans 8 and verse 1 from the New King James Version from the American Standard Version of 1901 and from the New American Standard Bible uh, both the 1977 and the 1995 update. You can see that this phrase, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, is omitted in these other two translations. And there's even a note in the King James Version, that says, uh, New King James, that says, in you, that abbreviation uh, stands for the Nestle and the United Bible Society text, omits the rest of this verse. Now this is the Textus Receptus, as it is often called, which began with Erasmus, uh, right after printing had been invented, Erasmus was the, you might say, the originator of the first printed Greek text. But he drew his work from several manuscripts. And we're going to talk some about the manuscripts tonight. Because I think as part of our understanding about Romans 8 and verse 1, we need to talk a little bit about how we know that we have the text of God's word as he gave it. The UBS text, obviously, is lacking that phrase. Now, today when we talk about textual criticism, some people immediately jump to the conclusion that we're talking about criticizing the Bible, and that is not the case. I can remember in 1974, as I was thinking as a young man about becoming a preacher of the gospel, I decided to start building a library. One of my early editions was a new translation on the market called the NIV. As I was looking through it, at the end of Mark, there was a note that said verses uh, 9 through 16 were not included in some, uh, in some early manuscripts. Well, that was rather shocking to me. And uh, I did not understand anything about the textual variance at that time. My first and initial reaction was, this is something that is something that's totally worthless. Well, later on, as I started my first work in Yakima, Washington, and in the very first Bible study I held with members of the church, there was a young man there who asked a question, and he was very, very earnest about it. He said, how do we know where the Bible came from? How, how do we know that this is, in fact, what was written down, you say, 2,000 years ago? And these are questions, obviously, that are on many people's minds. And I know that when I was probably uh, 14, 15, 16 years old as a young man, I would not have the least idea how to answer those questions. But uh, that question can be answered. 
And I believe that we have satisfactory evidence available to us to help us answer the question. And in the interest of time, I hope that you've also, while listening to me, have picked up from this definition here that criticism is not necessarily tearing something down, but simply a weighing and a making of, of a judgment. And we're not talking about sitting in judgment on the Word of God. We're talking about weighing a wealth of textual material that has to be looked at in order to arrive at uh, the text of God's Word. Now, verbal plenary inspiration is taught in God's Word, and I don't have the time to look at all these passages of Scripture. But I would encourage you to get a copy of this uh, slide presentation, which I'm sure Shahe will be glad to make available to you. And you look at these verses and you study this out for yourself. Because I've got a lot of material to cover and I'm going to uh, start my timer now. Sorry about that. I just tap it and start it. Tap resume and start it. Okay. Now I'm on the clock. Uh, God's Word insists, uh, God's Word exists apart from uh, any human being. There have been times when major parts of Western Europe had uh, about as much access uh, to copies of the Bible as, as uh, hardly, hardly at all. And uh, Scripture affirms that the inerrant inspiration of the original autographs by direct supervision of the Holy Spirit is absolutely true. We have several passages of Scripture in support of that. And Scripture affirms that God has providentially protected and preserves His Word in this world. But the question has to be raised and answered. Does he do that every time a copyist sits down and starts to write out a copy of the scriptures? Does he do that every time a printer takes his plates to the printing press and, and prints a new copy of the Bible? Or is it through the providence of a large number, a large number of uh, textual resources existing in many different languages, scattered geographically over a large part of the ancient civilized world, is that how he has preserved the text of the Bible? And I think the latter answer is the correct one. How we got the Bible is a basic introduction to some of the things that we're just going to briefly be talking about tonight. I'd recommend this book by Neil Lightfoot. And uh, another book that I found useful is the books and the parchments, How We Got Our English Bible by F.F. F. Bruce. From God to Us by uh, Geisler and Nix is a resource that's actually a condensed version from one of the uh, standard introductions that is used even still in many Bible colleges. A book that I came across recently that I found very useful is called The Journey from Texts to Translations by Paul Wegner. This is a book that's kind of supplanted the books and the parchments as a textbook on this subject in some of the local Bible colleges in Springfield, Missouri. We're, uh, I'm fortunate to have several there because I use their libraries a lot. And uh, this is a more technical work by Bruce Metzger, the late Bruce Metzger, on the text of the New Testament. It's transmission, corruption, and restoration. Now, the thing we need to get in our minds is that they didn't have printing presses in the Apostle Paul's day. Everything was hand copied, had been from ancient days. Moses wrote in a book, and writing by scribes is how anything that was written uh, was preserved. Now, whenever you've got handwriting and you've got the laborious task of copying a document, then it is almost inevitable that some minor errors are going to creep into it. Now, again, I want you to be clear. I'm not talking about errors in the original autographs. I'm talking about scribal errors in the transmission of the text from the days when the inspired men gave it to the church and our day. And uh, the simple fact is, we have such a wealth of information to draw on from all the texts that are available, we do not need to have any kind of, of uh, real substantial doubt about what is the text of God's Word. <clears throat> Now, we couldn't carry around Bibles made of stone. That wouldn't work at all. It has to be written on paper for it to be portable. Or today, we have these, these tablets. 
You know, the Babylonians had their tablets back then. We got our tablets now. And uh, so we have, we're, we're kind of seeing a revolution, you might say, in communication, such as was prompted by the inventing uh, of the printing press. But, uh, and it bodes well for the transmission of God's word to the world. One of the things that made sometimes the life of a scribe difficult in ancient times is that, uh, especially in the Hebrew text, they didn't put spaces between the words. How would you like to copy something the size of our Old Testament off of an exemplar? You are working from something that's just letters, no spaces between words, no punctuation. Well, it was a very laborious task, and we know that the Jewish scribes and later uh, the Christian scribes that were employed uh, in various offices, they took great care to make sure that their work was checked and double-checked. And uh, bottom line is, there were lots of things that could interfere with a scribe's concentration. This is one of the earliest fragments of any part of the Bible from the New Testament era. It is a part of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 33 through chapter 12, verse 9. You can see that this piece of, uh, this, this document is made of a fibrous material. Uh, it's starting to wear away here. But uh, there's a lot of these in existence. And we don't need to have any doubts about whether we have preserved what Paul or John or Matthew wrote. And, you know, to illustrate how that errors can creep into a text, even in the era of printing, we can look at several examples of printing errors in the Bible. Now, the fact that a human printer made an error in printing, or a, a scribe in his handwriting made an error in copying, is no reflection on the Word of God. That's not saying that the Word of God is full of errors. Now, there are certain people who want to destroy confidence in the Word of God who will try to make that connection. Maybe a college professor in a, uh, what's really a secular humanistic presentation of the Bible as literature will try to teach his students that the Bible's full of errors. You, you can't count on anything it says. Oh, there's 300,000 errors in the Bible. And so try to undermine and undercut the confidence of his students. But even in the era of printing, errors have been made in the printing of the Bibles. For example, in 1631, a Bible was printed by one of the printers who was privileged to be given a commission to print the King James Version. The man engaged in what might be called a false economy because... He got rid of his expensive, experienced typesetters and hired young men, inexperienced typesetters, to save money. And there weren't a lot of problems, but there was one big one. Over in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, they left out the word not. So it reads, thou shalt commit adultery. This became known as the Adulterer's Bible. The printer was fined 300 pounds by the crown, a significant sum of money. And it ruined his profession and ruined his life. Well, the reason was some boy in typesetting omitted three little letters. Changed the meaning dramatically, didn't it? But you see, even in the era of printing, errors can creep in, but those are human sourced not divine sourced. What is this about what some college professor might say about 300,000 errors in the Bible? Well, the first thing to remember is that when the textual critics go to counting variants, that is a more precise term and sounds better than errors, although some of these variants obviously arose because of scribal errors. When they count these variants, they're counting all kinds of things. The vast majority of these variants are extremely insignificant. For example, the way a word is spelled differently in different texts might be counted as a variant. And it's observed that there are five different ways of spelling the Greek word for resurrection in the existing manuscripts. Well, these aren't errors. They're just differences in time and place. I remember how much grief I took when I started editing the expositor, uh, 
And my spell checker would constantly tell me that judgment is not spelled with an E. So I got in the habit of spelling it without an E. And then lo and behold, if you go read a book published in England, more than likely judgment is spelled with an E. So these are among the so-called variants, uh, what some would call errors in the Bible. Well, those aren't errors at all. The vast majority are very minor differences, such as spelling, differences in phraseology. Modern translations often note the differences in footnotes. About half of 1% is in question, compared to 5% for the Iliad, one of the great documents of antiquity written by Homer. And it's only based on a uh, selection of 643 existing manuscripts. As Sir Frederick Kenyon, one of the great textual scholars of the past, has said, no fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith rests on a disputed reading. It cannot be too strongly asserted that in substance the text of the Bible is certain, especially is this the case with the New Testament. John A. Smith on the inspiration and the authority of the Bible says amazingly there are only four passages in the New Testament that are seriously challenged. They are John 7 verse 53 through chapter 8 verse 11, 1 John 5 and 7, Mark 16 verse 9 through 20, and Acts 8 and verse 37. Even if these passages were dismissed as spurious, not one significant matter of faith would be disrupted. What is taught in these disputed passages is repeated in other passages that are beyond doubt. Not one contradictory notion is presented in any one of these disputed passages. I find that amazing and faith building. Now what kind of changes were wrought? Well obviously sometimes there were changes that were the result of, of uh, faulty eyesight. Sometimes a letter might be read that looks similar to another letter by a scribe in his cell. And uh, that letter might be copied. Changes due to faulty hearing. Sometimes a reader would stand before a room full of men all laboriously copying what the reader said. And uh, someone might say, pair, let's just use an English word so we can understand, P-E-A-R, and some fellow out here writes down P-A-I-R. So you got a homonym there. Sometimes there were errors of the mind resulting in substitution of synonyms, changes in the sequence of words, and, and transposition of letters that would sometimes result in a different word. Errors of judgment sometimes. When a scribe was going along, he might be looking at an exemplar, maybe an older text from an earlier time, and he might be working, say, in the 6th century. And he's looking at a document from the uh, early 4th century. And he sees off to the side uh, a couple of lines of script. And sometimes that's how they corrected an omission. The scribe's writing along and, oh, I forgot a couple words. And so he just puts it in the margin. And so two centuries later, another scribe's looking at that. And he's thinking, now, is that a correction or is that just a marginal note? So he sticks it in the, sticks it in the text. Well, things like that have happened. The nice thing, the amazing thing, is that we can identify when those kinds of things have happened. Because we can understand how some of these things have happened, and I'm not going to go through this list, it would take up too much of my time. But detography is one of those things when a line or phrase is copied a second time by accident. And that may very well be what's going on in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. But look at the rich resources that textual scholars have to draw from. Papyri would be from the second and third century for the most part. Uncles, the writing style of writing all in capitals, those are very very early. We're talking third, fourth, and fifth centuries. Minuscules, that would be a flowing hand, what we'd actually call cursive writing. Uh, that, would, uh, that would be the majority of our Greek texts. These are the Greek manuscripts, lectionaries. And what they would do is they would copy out uh, from maybe there was only one large Bible in a congregation because these things were expensive to produce. Uh, scribes cost a lot of money and to produce a document the size of the New Testament cost a great deal. So there might be one uh, actual full copy of the New Testament in a congregation and they would copy out a portion for reading the lesson, uh, for reading to preach from. 
These are lectionaries, and there's a lot of these around. We have over, it's almost 6,000 now, this, this figure's probably a couple years out of date, uh, almost 6,000 extant Greek manuscripts. Well, we also have a wealth of translations. Very early translations were made into Latin and Ethiopian and uh, Syriac, Syriac Peshitta. We have manuscripts in these other languages. And we can compare them and, and uh, understand that uh, the vast majority support one reading. And uh, obviously this reading over here was a copyist mistake. So at the end of the day, uh, we have no excuse for not accepting what we have in the New Testament as the uh, faithfully preserved Word of God. My word, the Lord said, is not like man. Man is like the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the heaven. But my word shall endure forever. That's what Peter said. The manuscript evidence for the Bible far exceeds that for many of these other works of antiquity. Basically, the works of Tacitus rest upon about 20 of uh, ex existing manuscripts, and some of his minor works preserved in just one. And the time difference between when the manuscript was written, the copy was written, and when the original work is believed to have been produced is sometimes a thousand years or more. But we have manuscript evidence in the form of early papyri. Within 25 years, in some cases, of the writing of the New Testament, John was attacked in the 1800s as a spurious gospel written at the end of the second century. Today we have manuscripts from, uh, we have one from 125 AD, a papyrus manuscript of John that had to have been written within 30 to 50 years of, of the Gospels actual writing by John. Now, when we go to the Old Testament, there's literally a lot more time between the writing of the books by Moses and the other prophets and the text that we have, which is basically the Masoretic text from the 9th century. But a wonderful thing happened in 1947. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is an area, I know whole preacher study topics have been devoted to this. And they discovered that the difference in the text over a thousand years of time, many of these works found at the Dead Sea Caves were a thousand years older than the Hebrew text preserved by the Masoretes and, and from the ninth century. except for very minor differences. The message was not changed at all. It was the same Bible, the same text. So we have no reason to doubt that uh, our text is sound. Now, what happened is, among, with all these thousands of manuscripts in existence, Western Europe did not have access to very many of them until the fall of Constantinople to the Turks. That drove a lot of Greek scholars to the West, and they carried with them their Greek manuscripts. Now, uh, what began as a popular translation called the Vulgate for the Latin people eventually became, you might say, uh, ossified as the translation that all the world had to accept and bow down to. Uh, the Catholic Church insisted that the Vulgate was the only translation, the only Bible that could be used, and they even urged that against using the Greek manuscripts. So Erasmus did himself no favors with the Catholic Church when he insisted on collating together from a handful of manuscripts a Greek text for printing. Now we know that Cardinal, Cardinal Jimenez in Toledo, Spain actually put together a work called the Complutensian Polyglot earlier than Erasmus. And this was a Greek uh, text printed and uh, a Latin text, the Vulgate. And uh, the problem was Jimenez could not get ecclesiastical license to publish his work. And so Erasmus beat him to the press. So Erasmus has really the distinction of being the first printed Greek Testament. And this is the origin of what is called the Textus Receptus or the Received Text. And that phrase itself did not come about for about 200 years after the work of Erasmus. 
it went through revisions several times under uh, the uh, direction of men like Robert Stephanus, Theodore Beza, Bonaventure, and Abraham Elzevir, and others. The latest is the one from 1894 by Scrivener. And uh, since that time, other texts have come to the fore. And there is a basic difference in textual studies. I'm going to skip over these slides because I'm running out of time to get through this so I can get on to the other two. Today, there are several modern New Testament Greek texts. There's the Nestle Allen and the United Bible Societies, and they are exactly the same except for the apparatus, how the thing is organized for the sake of scholars. Westcott and Hort is very similar to them, and Westcott and Hort is what the uh, revised version of 1881 and the American Standard Version of 1901 is based upon. Hodges and Farstad, now remember Textus Receptus is also, you might say, the old Greek text, but Hodges and Farstad came up with the idea that a majority text, which is based on the Byzantine text form, textual uh, scholars refer to different text forms, and they would basically classify Hodges and Farstad as Byzantine, as well as Robinson and Pierpont, which is basically carried on the work of Hodges and Farstad. Maurice Robinson has written uh, an excellent work. I th in my judgment, I think that the Byzantine text form is the text form that is probably closest to the original. I say probably because I don't know that for a certainty. And one thing I want to say before I pass from this point, you know, that we've got these two major text forms that are the bases for our modern Greek printed texts, the Alexandrian and the Byzantine. Alexandrian based on some very ancient manuscripts and of course there are some legitimate criticisms that can be raised against the uh, whether this is the best way to go. On the other hand, Robinson and Pierpont as well as others before them like Hodges and Farstad argue for the Byzantine text form. If you want to know basically how different they are well, just open up 1 Peter, or any, any book in the New Testament. If you've got a New King James Version, if you open up any book in the New Testament, let's see, 1 Peter, let me get over there. Anytime there is any kind of significant difference between one text and the other, you'll find, for example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, there's an asterisk after whom having not seen. And uh, chapter 1, verse 8, note down there at the bottom says, M text. That's not in you. In you is the Nestle or United Bible Society's text. M text is the majority text. That would be Hodges and Farstad as far as uh, New King James is con uh, concerned or Robinson and Pierpont as they it basically is now. Okay, the word is known instead of seen. And then you see chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. And the note there, verse 12, the NU text and the M text read, you. Okay, you can go right through your New King James Version and you can see uh, really all of the significant differences between these two. Now I make that point to say this. I have heard people who claim that the uh, Textus Receptus is, is God's word and that any other text in that is a blasphemy on the Word of God, and vice versa. I've heard people that have contended that uh, the, text is correct, uh, the Textus Receptus is a corrupt text, and that uh, these moder the modern texts are the way to go. Um, neither position is true, with the exception of some very small differences. Whether you read the American Standard Version, or the New King James Version, uh, or any other formal equivalence translation. Now, I don't have time to get into formal equivalence versus dynamic equivalence. I can make a recommendation of a book that you ought to have in your library. It's called Accuracy in Translation by Robert P. Martin. But uh, the basic difference between these two is so minuscule as the the fellow said that I quoted earlier, no cardinal 
no important teaching of scripture whatsoever is violated. Now let's pass on to the main point we want to talk about. This is the Robinson Pierpont. This is the majority text, or actually more properly, they call it the Byzantine, the Byzantine text form. That phrase, who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit, is found in both verse 1 and in verse 4. The point to be made here is that if there was a scribal error that left it out at some point, we have not lost the truth. The simple fact of the matter is Romans chapter 8 teaches, whether it does in verse 1 or whether it does at the end of verse 4, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation with this qualification. You better not be walking after the flesh. You ought to be walking, you must walk after the Spirit. And so we have the New American Standard based on United Bible Societies, and we have the New King James Version based upon uh, the Textus Receptus. <coughs> and uh, anybody reading chapter 8 of Romans and not isolating a statement out of its context, like some people do, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, you know, not of works, lest any man should boast. Or that's actually verse 9. Well, you can isolate a passage out of its context, and then you're guilty of resting the scripture. But in this case, not only do we have the statement in the context here, but we have it in verse 13. Verse 13 says that we've got to mortify uh, the deeds of the flesh. And to fail to do so, of course, forfeits. The uh, forfeits the advantage of no condemnation in Christ. But I've got to hasten on. I've got 20 minutes. I think that I can uh, uh, deal, get this in 20 minutes. Let's look at Romans 12 and verse 1 now. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And uh, you can read the New American Standard for yourself there while I get me a drink of water. Most of your older translations use the term reasonable service or spiritual service to render the phrase that we're going to look at in a moment. Whereas many of your modern translations will render it as if it's talking about worship, spiritual service of worship, true and proper worship, and so forth. Oh, what difference does it make? Service, worship. Well, there, it does make a difference, especially in view of some people who are teaching some rank false doctrine today. Uh, let's take a quick look at some of the lexical evidence. Logikos, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is a word that is translated reasonable in reasonable service. And uh, I know that I don't have time to go through all of the material that I have here about uh, the lexical material, so I'm going to hasten on here. But uh, the difference primarily has been, should it be translated reasonable, as in logical, and, or should it be translated spiritual? I think in the context here, reasonable is better, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. But the real controversy is over the translation of this word, latria. The International Dictionary of New Testament Theology says this is service or worship of God. Thayer says this is service. The, originally, the word meant service rendered for hire than any service. Uh, Bauer, Danker, Art and Gingrich, service slash worship of God. That's exactly how it appears on the page in their particular reference work. Now, the idea here is that some want to translate it as referring to worship, others want to translate it as referring to service. And one thing I'd like to call your attention to is a passage that we find in the book of Matthew, chapter 4 and verse 10. And uh, this passage of scripture is a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy, which has a great deal to say about worship and service. But Jesus is being tempted, and when the devil asks him if he will fall down and worship him, Jesus says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now, those words are not exact 
synonyms. They, do, are, they are not exactly equivalent. We have in our world today a philosophy that says that all of life is worship. And you may say, no, that didn't sound too bad. But now, here, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. I'm going to come back to Deuteronomy 10 just a bit here. The word latria. Uh, well, rather, I want to go here first. Hugo McCord. Hugo McCord is a Church of Christ scholar. He is a man who is um, deceased now. But uh, I've read a lot after him over the years. And I found that he has a pretty good grasp on some of the issues that we're struggling with in understanding this passage of Scripture. Hugo McCord was very conservative. And because of that, he was, although he was a college professor at Freed Hardeman in Tennessee, and although he was a very uh, well-studied man, he was not appreciated by many of his uh, Church of Christ brethren. I'm talking about those who worship with cups and classes and have since long gone past just cups and classes. They've gone into all kinds of things, trying to become more and more denominational all the time. But here's what he wrote in his translation of uh, the New Testament, which he calls the Everlasting Gospel, and sometimes known as the Freed Hardeman Translation. I've got a copy with me, and I find it uh, very helpful in many respects because he has some really good textual notes, has some good information on the ending to Mark and some good information on, uh, for example, the Ethiopian's confession in Acts chapter 8. But here's what he says about Romans 12 and verse 1. The NIV, the NASV, and the NRSV err in inserting the word worship in Romans 12 verse 1 and in Hebrews 12 verse 28, making everything a Christian does, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, worship. The normal word meaning worship, proskuneo, is not in Romans 12 verse 1 and Hebrews 12 verse 28. Now in that passage, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, where Jesus says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Worship is proskuneo. And he says, And him only shalt thou serve. That's the word latria. So bear that in mind as we read McCord's comments. And for good reason. No one can worship, that is to adore and to honor God. It's a mental activity. Seven days a week and 24 hours a day. It may be expressed in bowing down before someone. I'm adding my comment right here. You won't read that there. But uh, it is a mental adoration and respect toward, uh, toward God. Worship is a mental action and has to be stop and go. He cites Genesis 22, verse 1 and 5. Abraham says, uh, I and the world will go yonder and worship. And some other passages. It is invisible, that is within me. Psalm 42, verse 4 through 5. And vertical toward heaven, John 17, verse 1. The word in Romans 12, verse 1, and in Hebrews 12, 28, simply means to serve, which does involve everything a Christian does, seven days a week and 24 hours a day. It can refer to the visible actions performed in worship services, Romans 9, verse 4. But the worship itself is wholly internal. A Christian glorifies God in everything that he does, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but he cannot adore God continuously. He doesn't, everything isn't worship. There's a distinction. Now, why is all this important? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. We have some people today saying things that are really sophistry. All of life is worship. That means what we do here Sunday morning isn't necessarily that important. That's what they're getting at. That's exactly what they're getting at. And you can see it. A bad tree brings forth evil fruit. And that's what we are seeing over the last 20, 30 years. That this idea has been accepted into some parts of the restoration movement. How can such an innocuous statement be so very dangerous? Well, I'll tell you how it can be dangerous. I was at the 1986 debate in Yosho, Missouri between Given Blakely and Alan Hires. It was on instrumental music. And uh, during that debate, Given Blakely, who represented the independent Christian churches, which has just gotten more and more liberal over the last 30 years, said something that astounded me. He said, worship is the right thing to do. There's no wrong way to do it. 
That's sophistry. And I'll tell you what, it's first cousin to all of life is worship. Which means you can worship in your car, on the bank, throwing your line in to catch a trout. That's, that's where that's going. And that's where they intend for it to go. I was sitting there, by the way, and thinking, hires, here's your chance. All you got to do is take them over to 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 11. You'll prove them wrong. There are rules for worship. Well, <laughs> hires didn't do it. Probably because while he was defending the truth on instrumental music, he practiced cups and classes, and as a result of that was liable to being uh, embarrassed by his use of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Corinthians 11. But I pass on. The idea is that there are people today, and one of these is a fellow by the name of Mike Root, has written a couple of books published by College Press, 1992 and 1997, in which he's advocated a whole new attitude away from traditional worship. And today there are lots of people, and sadly these are people even among, well, used to be among us, who uh, denigrate traditional worship, who, who laugh with derision at the idea of five items of worship. You know, I think these are, I don't think, I know these are scripture. This is the word of God. But when people forget the word of God, then they're bound to wander off into all kinds of sophistries. Well, Brother Greg Gay wrote a really excellent article in the December 98 issue of The Expositor on some of the things that Mike Root said in Spilt Grape Juice. But then he went on to write some more stuff in Unbroken Bread. And one of the things that he really uh, floated in that work is this idea of all of life is worship. And it has been responded to uh, quite capably by a number of brethren. The simple fact is, worship is something that the Bible gives us, the New Testament gives us a pattern for. This is derided and mocked by many in our world today. All of life is worship. Poor ignorant backwoods person, you, don't you understand all of life is worship? And they're trying, it's, it's kind of like the evolutionist trying to persuade a young kid. Evolution must be true. You see change in the world all around you, don't you? Change, change, that's all evolution is, is change. See, they're redefining the term, make it less offensive. And that's what they're doing in another way with this idea all of life is worship. They're saying, oh, you're, you're too confined in your thinking that you're just limiting it to a place and a time and uh, a location. Uh, no matter that uh, 1 Corinthians 14 several times says when you come together into one place. Yes, there is such a thing as scriptural worship. There is a scriptural pattern of worship. There are regulations for worship. And uh, we can find those in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14. And elsewhere. But it's more, more than just about uh, that. I think one of the main driving motive forces of this idea, all of life is, is worship. And this is brought out by uh, one writer, I think his name was uh, Kevin Kane, is, that, is promoting an unscriptural role for women in leading worship. With a touch of sarcasm, this is what the writer says. Root writes, Women can talk all they want to before and after that magical opening and closing prayer because being silent in the church is only referring to the formal assembly. And so he, he makes a mockery of uh, the rules of the assembly is what he's doing. And uh, so he's suggesting as he does in his work, Unbroken Bread, that Paul's restrictions on women in 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 12, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 through 35, are just dealing with specific first century problems. You know, pretty soon, as one of the brethren said earlier tonight, they'll explain away the whole book of 1 Corinthians because it was something that was culturally re relevant in the first century. It doesn't apply to us today. Well, that, of course, is ignorant and it is dangerous. But that's why it is important that we get this translation right. Let's go back over there. And the idea is, yes, we have worship. 
There's time that we worship, but not all of life is worship. All of life is service. And that's what the writer is talking about here. And this is at the point where Paul makes a transition from the doctrinal part of Romans over to the practical part. I've done some preaching on Romans 12, 13, 14, and first part of 15, and I call it, the series of lessons is, how to get along with everybody. How to get along with God. Well, you offer him the reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? Why is it logical? Well, because of what he wrote in the first 11 chapters. Chapters 1 through 3, you're a sinner. You're doomed. All you deserve is death. Chapters 4 through 11, how God can and does justify the wicked through Jesus Christ. Well, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I love to hold forth on that idea about a living sacrifice. Brethren, there's some great sermon ideas here, so you better grab them while you can. <laughs> Let's move on. I need to get on to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Okay. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. This is in the salutation, opening, opening words of uh, for the, the epistle of Peter. To, for, to the, well, let me pull it up here. I should have had this uh, already set up on the, on the uh, slide here. But these are people who are scattered over what we would call uh, a, a Turkey today, the country of Turkey. And uh, there in the first verse, he says, in his greeting to these brethren, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. We have here a greeting uh, from, from Peter on behalf of the Godhead. And references made to a role that the God, each member of the Godhead has played in their salvation, in their being elect, being chosen. Now, we're not going to talk about predestination or foreordination or foreknowledge of God. That's not our topic tonight. We can talk about that another time. But it's not a foreknowledge of individuals. It is of a class of people who would uh, do something in particular. So God is the one who has done this election through his foreknowledge. He planned it all ahead of time, in other words. And then it involves sanctification by the Spirit. Now the Bible tells us you know, whenever, you, whenever you're perplexed by uh, an idea, the thing is to find the simplest passage about it, and that will help you to measure and judge everything else as you learn what the scriptures have to say about a subject. And we have the plain statement of Jesus in John 17, verse 17, where he prays for his disciples, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We talked about this a couple years ago when I did a presentation on Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in regards to the uh, salvation of man was to reveal that word and to accredit that word by enabling those men who first preached it to work miracles. The signs that confirmed the truth of their message. And then this third phrase, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The New American Standard actually has quite good translation here. To obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Now what happened was in 1983, there was an article written by a fellow by the name of Frank Agnew. And uh, this Agnew took the position that was uh, heralded by certain Calvinist leaning people that uh, this ought to be translated so as to refer to the obedience of Christ. Now, is the obedience of Christ important in the scheme of redemption? Absolutely. In the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Francis Agnew raised the issue of whether this passage refers to Christ's obedience. With the exception of a handful of commentators and the New Living Translation, most scholars have rejected this idea. Not because the obedience of Christ is unscriptural. It's, it's very scriptural. Absolutely. But in this particular passage of Scripture... Uh, that's not what is in view. Now, Agnew's argument, basically, to boil it right down, was twofold. 
First of all, he claimed, and this is an old discussion. We've been having this with the Baptist uh, for, for decades, if not centuries. Ice, the word that's translated to or unto or for. Does it have causal force, meaning because? Uh, a lot of your Baptist friends would love to read Acts 2.38 where it said, Repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins. But that's not scriptural. And although Dana and Manti in their textbook uh, tried to make that uh, the case several years ago, it is not scriptural, and they were shot down by those who had a, were in position to do so. But uh, we believe that in this passage of scripture, as in every other place, the, the telic force, that means purpose, the purpose of preposition should be translated unto or for. And the sprinkling of the blood of Christ does not refer to Christ's actual, well, in a secondary sense it does. But let's look at this. Christ's obedience is taught in Scripture as being the foundation of our salvation. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, we're not saying for one moment that the uh, sacrifice of Jesus is unimportant. His, his death his shedding of blood is not important. We're not saying that. But what is that passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 teaching? Romans 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. But now the big question is, between us and the Calvinists, as we discuss imputed righteousness, is how, how are the benefits of his obedience applied to us. Hebrews 5 verse 8 through 9. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. His obedience qualified him to be the Lamb of God. To give us an example and to be a perfect atoning Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. But he has done all that so that we can then obey him by obedience to the gospel. And failing in that, then we cannot enjoy the benefits of his blood. Now, in 1 Peter, there's a lot said by Peter about obedience. And this, I think, develops from what is said in verse 2. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance... And then in verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. The thrust of what Peter is saying here in this context is encouraging these brethren in continued obedience. Well, I've already discussed this, kind of jumped ahead and anticipated this a little bit. But uh, the whole idea that ice had a causal uh, force and could be, in trans could be translated because uh, was rejected in the early 1950s by many scholars. I've got more exact references in my notes here. And only the New Living Translation has adopted Agnew's suggestion, which he made in 1983, and that is because of the obedience of Jesus Christ, which tends to support uh, a Calvinistic view of imputed righteousness. But uh, here is what I believe is being referred to by Peter. Now, in the Old Testament, there are three occasions when people are sprinkled. The leper is sprinkled with blood after he's cleansed. Aaron and his sons were consecrated to the priestly office by being sprinkled with a mixture of oil and blood. But most commentators point to Exodus 24 as, you might say, the Old Testament background the imagery that Peter is drawing from as he teaches these brethren about, at the same time, you know, he said what God, God has done, what the Holy Spirit is, is doing, and Jesus emphasizing their need to obey him. And so, let me get back to Exodus chapter 24 on my tablet here. And uh, pardon me, I'm still... I haven't had so much fun with a birthday gift since I got a pair of cat pistols when I was a kid. But this is really a great instrument. Nice to carry along when you go on home visits. 
you know, when you see a guy walking up to your front door with a great big Bible under his arm, they tend to run and hide, act like they're not home. But when you walk up with a tablet, they don't know what that is. <laughs> Still the Bible in there, though. Here's what I want to read. Exodus chapter 24, beginning at verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words of the Lord we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Now that is the image that comes up in the mind of these people in this dispersion, in that part of the world then. They're familiar with their Old Testament scriptures when, when this point is made by Peter here. They're bound to the Lord Jesus in a covenant. It's a new covenant. It's a superior covenant. And obedience is required. Well, my time is far gone. So I am going to end it there and we'll entertain questions.